Transolar have been in operation for 20 years now. They have made themselves a reputation as internationally leading climate engineers with offices in Stuttgart, Munich, New York, and now I hear Paris imminently. They have virtually invented and established their discipline and made it, the discipline and themselves, an indispensable ingredient of every respectable design process. They have thus been working with a lot of big-name architects on all sorts of important and less important projects. If Matthias starts to go on a name-dropping rage, he can hardly be stopped. <laughs> Quite rightly, too, because they have been acting as client advisors, as consultants to designers, planners, politicians, and lay individuals. As consultants, <coughs> and they have been taking part in all sorts of seminars, lectures, and conferences. For the older ones of them, I can see several routes towards a totally untroubled retirement age, and for the younger ones, the niche is there to be occupied. Theirs is a singular success story, so why are they now asking to maximize their impact? Are they crazy, immodest, greedy? To cut a long story short, the answer is probably yes, all three of the latter, but that is how they got to where they are. <laughs> <laughs> However, seriously, if one looks at their question for one moment not as a quest for global market expansion, but as a serious expression of their frustration with the seeming futility of their, and by implication, our own endeavor, it might be more difficult to answer. If you are asking whether what we are doing in reality is just some kind of displacement activity, something to keep ourselves busy while we are missing the real issues, something that helps to maintain the illusion of our own importance, then the question is quite pertinent and indeed existential, as it puts the chainsaw of doubt to the thin branch that we all, and Transola in particular, are sitting on. I have to admit, being German, that I have been awake at night, asking myself some of these questions and the answers I give myself in order to get some sleep go like this. There are a few basic facts to which we can probably all agree. First, we have a problem with, a serious problem with climate change, and climate change is caused by the rise of the overall temperature of the planet. Second, the rise in temperature is probably caused by a number of things, but we are sure that the excessive emission of carbon dioxide contributes significantly to this phenomenon. Thirdly, the construction sector, at least in, the Western, in our Western countries, has something like 40% a 40 share in these emissions, and hence the building community should be able to effect some significant reductions in those emissions. And fourthly, the need and the principal readiness to achieve these reductions has been stated publicly many times and is part of various political agendas. Nevertheless, the results are disappointing, and global carbon dioxide emissions are rising steadily every year. What can be done? Well, so far, we all have been engaging in what one could call best practice. This is a mixture of demand reduction in buildings overall and improved efficiency in building components, as well as the pioneering of renewable energies. These are, broadly speaking, also the strategies that Transolar have been advocating sometimes intelligently, sometimes less intelligently, for the last 20 years. But now, you guys complain that we all together represent only approximately 2% of all construction and building design activity, and therefore our efforts are futile. They are neg negligible, just a rounding error in the grand global equation. Just to carry on with difficult and ex existential questions, one can also ask what difference the reduction of, say, 50% of the energy consumption of a single building can make, as, as such an achievement is obviously like a droplet of water in the vast desert of consumption. Why all this fuss? Why all these efforts if the best possible outcome is in any case irrelevant? And thirdly, you will find out sooner or later that our common design strategies are only small parts of the equation, even locally. Whether you can achieve your design goals or not largely depends on the behavior of the occupants of your buildings. 
Just to give you an example, what you just saw was the environmental agency in Dessau, and this is the uh, design uh, performance that we, uh, our engineers uh, calculated at the end of the uh, construction phase, 73 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, and this is what we uh, calculated, uh, what we measured in the first year. You see on the very right, the green bar is 140 kilowatt hours per year uh, primary energy. In other words, approximately just double. And now, <coughs> oh, I'm very sorry. Well, <laughs> this is as much as integrating, integration of Macs and My, uh, Macintosh in Microsoft goes, but anyway, <laughs> what you will see at the bottom right, what you would see at the bottom right if this was a Mac on the other side, um, was actually that now in 2000, the last uh, completed measurement is 2009, it, it's, we're just below, just around the 90, 90 kilowatt hours um, per year, per uh, square meter and year. And, uh, and, and this has been monitored and measured in detail. And this is due largely to partially non-functioning technology. At the beginning, we had a lot of problems with um, uh, equipment not working, but it's mostly to do with user, beha user behavior. In other words, those kind of 50 kilowatt hours, um, it's almost like 100% of the initial performance, that was reduced due to uh, changed um, be uh, user behavior. So, the change of user behavior could be a powerful tool in the quest to stop climate change. We would, not, we, would not, we would not need any hybrid or electric cars if people were willing to move around on their bikes. If there was a law that prohibited the use of motor vehicles in cities, we, would, we could resolve a huge number of environmental problems from one day to another. If people, <coughs> similarly, we, don't, we wouldn't, need people man, need, wouldn't need building management systems in office buildings if people were willing to open windows, close sunshades, as is fit for their building environment. If people would accept to wear sweaters in their office in the winter uh, and a, a, a light clothing in the summer when it is hot, much energy could be saved without any revolution in heating or cooling equipment. What I'm trying to say is that a lot of energy consumption is caused by our expectations of comfort. We could avoid a lot of emission and hence make a big difference in our global problems immediately if we were willing to be happy with less. So if TransSolar are looking for something to do in the next 20 years, try and find ways to redefine the idea of luxury. If you were to succeed, to make people happy with other ways than the consumption of more and more, you would have a massive impact. Of course, and this is a theme that will stay, this is a theme that will stay with us, <coughs> your activity will sooner or later start to undermine the economical model you and we all are working to. You will have to, have, you will have to question growth. Now what I tell myself at this point in my sleepless night is that we can work towards qualitative growth and thus compensate for a reduction of quantity. And frankly, if I didn't believe that, that my architecture can make a positive difference to people's life, I should probably give up practicing, let alone teaching architecture. Our task as designers is to make our clients and the users of our buildings complicit in our plan. We have, to make the better, we have to have the better arguments, but as people are reacting towards the built environment, not only rationally, but in most cases instinctively, we will have to seduce them on top with the most beautiful architecture we can possibly produce. Because without their complicity, even the most intelligent strategy, the most efficient technology, will bitterly fail. To come to the second question, is the design of a building the right beginning to start a campaign against climate change? change? Isn't the idea of construction already counterproductive? And should one lose time with such small particles if, we, if one is really trying to change the whole system? It is obvious that there is an, that there is an economy of scale. Replacing a coal-fired power plant with a wind farm will be more efficient, will have much larger, larger long-term impact than the 70% reduction of a single household's heating bill. Whatever, as we are however, as we are experiencing even here in Germany, where the government has committed itself to the so-called Energiewende, i.e. the midterm preference of renewable over nuclear power, such large-scale reform is very difficult to achieve. 
The great advantage of the small intervention over the large-scale strategy is that it is immediate and direct. Should one therefore wait until, until the big energy concerns such as E.ON or RWE have, just, have come around to constructing large wind farms in the North Sea, or should one just go ahead and buy the mini fuel cell CHP for the basement? The answer to this dilemma is probably do both. Any method is justified as long as it really brings us closer to our joint aims. Many small interventions can add up to a lot, and there's no reason not to experiment with all sorts of strategies. At the same time, of course, one must never, leave, uh, le never let the large scale come out of, of, out of one's horizon as one is thinking about smaller um, projects. Even better, if it is possible to upgrade some existing structure. Principally, new construction is obviously only sensible if A, there is some real need for it, and B, if the result represents a significant improvement also in, ter also in terms of energy consumption. Finally, to come back to the initial question, isn't it all too negligible to even talk about? Are the battles we are constantly claiming to be winning really significant? Well, if one wants to continue to use the metaphor of warfare, what we are really involved in is guerrilla battle. And I honestly think that we are making progress. If just within my very limited horizon, I, for example, look at how many people have come to visit our building in Dessau. In the seven years of its existence, one is surprised about both numbers and spread. Approximately 42,000 people from 50 countries have visited this demonstration building. That is 25 people every single working day, half of them professionals. And if those 12 professionals, maybe, a th maybe of those uh, 12 professionals, maybe a third gets infected and start to carry the virus into their professional life, be it in practice or in academia, the snowball effect can be phenomenal. All we need is a bit of patience, and the impact will maximize itself. What is crucial, though, is that we keep on producing projects that are working well on one hand and providing an experience on the other that people will remember. And it is totally crucial that we are honest and precise about the results achieved. The widely spread, unsubstantiated rhetoric about miraculous achievements is in, in, in building projects <clears throat> that turn out to be quite spurious on closer inspection doesn't help anybody. It spreads mistrust and justified criticism. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth propaganda is, very, is a very powerful tool both ways, for the better and for the worse. Um, <clears throat> at this point, I would just like to mention that all the projects that I'm showing, of all the projects that I'm showing, only this one this one is one that we've done with Transsolar. Although um, we've been working together for probably all 20 years, and I love both Matthias and Stefan. We've been working on many projects, and Arnaud. We've been working uh, together in, uh, in France. But <coughs> uh, it is important to know that there is a whole community of engineers and specialists who are thinking along in the same field, and the maximization of um, the impact is actually very much already happening. Particularly in relationships to emerging countries, our societies are privileged in many ways. It is obvious that these privileges come with a huge responsibility. We have no choice but to accept the role of an elite where the categorical imperative applies. Hence, our joint performance has to be exemplary in every respect. No need to repeat that there are inevitable conflicts with the commercial logic within within which every single one of us has to operate. One final thought. Um, <clears throat> our first significant low-energy building, uh, the GSW Tower, is now 22 years old in its conception and has been in use for more than 13 years. We have continued to build about a dozen more buildings with similar ambitions. If I try to attempt a tentative conclusion of what we think to have learned in those years, it is the insight that our environmental strategies have maybe not been simple enough. What, um, 
What we have done has been copied all over the world, and of course, we have been uh, has been. What people have been trying to imitate are most of all the aesthetics of our buildings, not necessarily the way they work. And of course, we are very upset with these Chinese colleagues. <laughs> with these Chinese colleagues who so shamelessly help themselves with our work, as in this example. And we criticize them on top for their superficiality in, imi in, in imitating just the surface. However, one could turn the criticism around and ask whether this type of replication isn't exactly what should be happening. And that may be one of the reasons why only the aesthetics are being copied is to do with the fact that the environmental strategies are too complex and too expensive. We are currently engaged um, in a follow-up project to the environmental agency. Um, <coughs> where we have tried to simplify things as much as possible. We have done away with, with almost all building management systems. We are relying on a super simple strategy such as cross-ventilation through convection, openable windows, hand-operated solar blinds, and that is more or less it. If we can meet our energy targets this way, replication will be simple and maybe more comprehensive next time. We have completed one such lean project in the past, too recent though to have really uh, reliable results. We admire young officers who go and export their knowledge and skills into environments of low technological standards. This combination of basic technology and planning intelligence seems a winning combination to me because maybe it is us who have to learn from the so-called third world rather than the other way around. This is a school project in Pakistan by the Berlin office Siegert, Rosbach and Seiler and just as another example, a training center in Marrakesh by a team around the young architect Anna Heringer. Thank you very much. <laughs>